I'm Joanne Gallagher, host of the Think Future podcast. This week, we're talking with Paolo Bevilacqua of Fraser's Property. Join us in a minute for the conversation as Paolo shares some pivotal moments during his career in the built environment and advocates for the value and power of authentic leadership. This podcast is brought to you by Arcons, a global leader pioneering solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support digital transformation for the built environment and smart manufacturing. Visit Arcons.net to learn more about how Arcons are helping organizations design, build and sell through digitalization. From Arcons to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to Archon's Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews, and profiles. Paolo Bevilacqua is an executive that has delivered industry-leading programs and solutions at both project and organizational levels across real estate and energy sectors in multiple geographies over a 20-year career. In 2022, Paolo was appointed Fraser Property Limited, inaugural Group Head of Sustainability. In this role, Paolo is responsible for sustainable strategy for the group's multinational and diversified operations. Prior to this role, Paolo was the founding general manager and chair of Fraser Properties Real Utilities, an energy retailer and utilities business delivering carbon neutral energy to customers. Before joining Fraser's Property, Paolo held various sustainability and renewable energy roles, working on some of Australia's leading green building projects and new business solutions. Paolo is Vice Chair of the International Living Futures Institute and Chair of the Property Council of Australia's National Sustainability Roundtable. Welcome to the program, Paolo. Thanks, Joanne. With such an impressive career path, beginning as a civil and environmental engineer in 98, becoming the head of sustainability for Fraser's property. Maybe you could walk us through some of the highlights and inspiration on your journey thus far. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm really, first up, just grateful to have had such a a long career now in in sustainability. It's an area that that I'm really passionate about, very close to my heart, because uh, I feel like I can can make a genuine difference. I developed that interest in sustainable design while I was actually at university uh, and towards the end of my degree in civil and environmental engineering, or probably about halfway through, started getting a bit exposed to the environmental side and environmental law and, and sustainability. And that kind of led me to, to doing my thesis on my capstone project, it was called, uh, at, at UTS, University of Technology in Sydney, in sustainable design and looking at how to take, you know, a very traditional, classic Australian suburban home and make it uh, retrofitted to make it more sustainable. That was in the, uh, in the 90s. And yeah, really found that just super exciting and interesting. And and then I got, you know, I was lucky enough to get a job in sustainable design starting at Lend Lease and working on some some really interesting projects. I was exposed to some of the work of Michael Mobbs uh, as through my university and, and uh, that was really interesting looking at how people that were trying to take their homes, in particular he was living in the inner city of Sydney looking to take his home off grid. And I found that quite interesting because it was you know, technically possible even even then, you know, with the technology that existed, still still hard, but actually a lot of the constraints were related to, to people or regulation and not, not the technology. And so that that kind of human aspect of it or regulatory aspect or kind of you know behavioral mindset part of it got me quite quite curious about uh, the industry. And yeah, I was lucky enough to work for companies yet, yeah, like I said, like Lend Lease and then, you know, Australand and, and and Fraser's subsequently uh, on some quite significant projects um, that allowed me to, to kind of stretch my expertise in new areas like renewable energy and waste and water management. Um, you know, spend a lot of time working with different people in the organisation and externally collaborating with different organisations as they kind of emerge, like Green Building Council. Yeah, so. Lots of highlights along the way, which I'm sure we'll kind of get into through the conversation, but uh, it's really been an interesting path. Certainly. Well, you have a very broad experience there, and I'd like to dig into some of the mindset stuff later. But you mentioned there you've been with Fraser's property for, well, I can see that it's 12 years now. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. October 2011. Wow. So you must have some key learnings that shape 
uh, your role, the current role over that time. Would you like to tell us what they were? Yeah, look, across uh, my time at Fraser's and, and uh, even Land Lease, you know, I, I got to work on a diverse range of projects and asset classes, you know. So at Fraser's, we work on five key asset classes, industrial, residential, uh, retail, office, and hospitality. And, you know, I, I got to get exposure to, to those different types of assets and then different technological solutions and business models. Like I spent a lot of time learning about uh, renewable energy and solar um, and the energy sector because that was one of the key opportunities for, for properties to, to really uh, decarbonize and that, and that decarbonization has been one of my key focus areas. You know, so learning about different asset classes across different geographies, you know, different countries, and then even different sectors like you know that energy and how that interacts with with property uh, is something that I've learned a lot about, and and just being curious really about learning new things, you know, not having that awareness that you know as sustainability uh, professionals we don't need to know everything about sustainability it's it's basically impossible to do that but we do have need to have that curiosity to understand um, the challenges of the business understand the external market drivers understand the various opportunities that exist and then look at how do we build the capability inside the organization to collectively respond to that. That's what I find so interesting. It's it's lots of times early in my career there was just that, you know, you'd present something that felt like a good idea and, and you'd get that that resistance to change um, just because that's human nature. And working through that and working with building relationships at, at all levels was, was something that I got a lot out of uh, because I think deep down a, a lot of people want to, want to try and do their work in a better and a more impactful way um, and have that stronger purpose. And the, the, the roles that I did um, and, and the learnings that I gained were really about how do we how do we work together with people to kind of really understand their concerns as we're in, in integrating these solutions around sustainability so that we can move forward together. And, and that having that real collaborative approach is really the key to getting sustainability outcomes. It's a real skill in being a leader to be able to pull all that together, which we'll get into a little bit later. I'm really curious about how you did that. The next thing I'd love to know is about your defining moment when you realized that you wanted to raise your own leadership to the role of a sustainability professional that you're in now. What was that defining moment for you? Yeah, I've thought about this a little bit and, and I I pinpoint it to a time and there were a few moments where my career took a new step and I my role evolved and, and so on. But a lot of those were kind of incremental. You know, you've spent a bit of time in a role and then you, you become uh, better at what you're doing and then it's kind of you're, you you take the next step. But I think a pivotal moment was when I was at Fraser's and we had a change of CEO and Rod Fairing became the new CEO. And he really, Rod's a, a, a real authentic leader. Um, he really focused a lot on on people, on relationships, and 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 the community, and and really doing best for the customers we serve, the communities we serve, whilst you know obviously still delivering um, solid commercial outcomes and returns, which we're expected to do as a business. And I saw a really close alignment between his values and the sustainability vision that I really wanted to try and advocate for, and he gave me that opportunity. You know, he one of the first things he did was I think it, you know, it would have been around 2015. I think roughly he said, you know, and I was the most senior person in sustainability uh, within the organisation. So he got me in. I, I wasn't reporting to him at the time, and he said, you know, look, what's our what's our 2030 vision for sustainability? And I said, oh, we don't have one. Sorry, Rod, <laughs> I've got some ideas, but we we don't have a 2030 strategy. He goes, well, we need to have one. We need to think. Uh, we need to be bold and we need to set some some ambitious targets and really get going now towards those. And that was just such a great opportunity. So to me, I think that was that defining moment. It was still very hard, but but Rod's leadership provided the platform for me to be able to do that and it really stretched me tremendously. I spent probably close to a year, you know, once Rod gave that mandate, just 
bringing together a lot of people in the organization to help shape what that 2030 vision should be. You know, so it wasn't about me going back and sitting at my desk and drawing up a, a 2030 plan. It was really about how could we use that mandate that, that Rod had provided uh, and that ambition to, to kind of galvanize a broader leadership team and then, and then bring together the other levels of management and operations within the business to develop that plan together. And, you know, so we, we worked through a process of a lot of workshops. We, we looked at what was most material, what was most important to us from a sustainability perspective as, as a real estate company, you know, operating across, you know, diverse range of asset classes in the Australian market. Yeah, so understanding what that meant, understanding what leadership looked like, uh, and understanding where we could have an impact, and defining that, you know, down to okay, well, here's what 2030 might look like, but what do we need to start doing now? And that real, that you know, that that process of developing that together was really fulfilling. It really and it built capability within the organisation. It, it, I learned a lot about the business side of things and what we do as a business, and understanding what those the challenges are and and equally what some of the opportunities might be, but also the people side of things and, and how challenging that is in, in regards to executing a, you know, a change program because ultimately that's, that's what it was that we're setting about. You know, we're, we're looking to establish a new vision for the organisation around sustainability and that re- changes in the way we did things. Uh, and we call that strategy a different way. And it was called a different way because you know, the world was demanding a different way of going about doing business. And that's what we had to try and instill throughout the organization. And of course, people are so important to get to engage them through your leadership. So when it comes to building professional relationships, you touched on it, of course, but could you expand on why it is so important? Definitely. Yeah. I think many people miss the, the kind of core of, of the importance of relationships to drive genuine progress. Uh, a lot of people try to, to kind of chase the a task or a technical solution. So they say, oh, we need to do more solar energy or we need to use low carbon steel or we need to um, do some other initiative. And they focus too much on that task without really focusing on the key relationships they need to develop and understanding how they can work with people to achieve the initiative. So early on, I kind of recognize that and I focused a lot more on listening. And understanding people's motivations and perspectives as opposed to just putting initiatives out there. Because I think when when you do that, you really get the buy-in and alignment of those other stakeholders. And then it becomes a collective effort to try and achieve the change that you want to achieve. And so, you know, the other thing I realized was that there, there was always consistently, it was, I was consistently reminded of the commercial reality of business. As a result of that, of that consistent reminder, I was quite pragmatic about how we went about doing things and what I put forward to stakeholders and really understanding that, yes, there is a sustainability outcome we want to achieve, but I understand that there's a commercial reality in which we operate. And the initiatives over that I look back on that worked were the ones that really addressed both that commercial need and that sustainability outcome. Uh, and we could find that common ground. And that common ground was about, or well, it was really built on a trusting relationship. So I think that probably talks to the the point around relationship. I, I think relationships are more important than tasks. And as I continue to, to kind of progress through my career, it actually just increases in importance. The the you know that is in the importance of relationships over tasks. Well, what strikes me is that you need a certain amount of emotional intelligence to, to be able to do that. You know, as a leader, would you say? that you're an emotionally intelligent person or you think there's another skill that you have that helps those relationships work? I think it's something that I've worked a lot on. I don't think it's something you you ever get to mastery of um, emotional intelligence, but I think I've definitely built it as a foundational kind of skill set of mine. Um, recognizing what's happening in the room, the feel of in the room or the feel of how a relationship is going, really having that self-awareness is critical. Uh, and I think, you know, emotional intelligence is about genuinely listening to people and not just listening to the words they're saying, 
but through recognizing the body language or recognizing what's happening when you leave the room, you know. And and so I've become much more aware of that. It's it's a fine line between the the awareness of it and then overthinking. And I was a massive overthinker. And I think that's an area where I've had to focus a lot on, you know, really noticing my thought process and not letting letting things kind of spiral out of control in my head. Actually just stopping and say, well, where am I right now with this relationship, with this issue, whatever it might be, rather than, than kind of projecting something that has not happened. So, you know, that's all part of emotional intelligence. I think uh, some other, you know, more practical tools that are, are that I've relied on are things like uh, you know the Herman Brain um, Index, which which actually looks at um, behavioural styles and and you know it's you, you know you can actually go through the process of doing an assessment of yourself to identify and your team members identifying different behavioural styles. But once you know them, you can actually start to even 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 though you may not know someone else's, you can see based on the way they behave, um, the way they respond to things based on what they're, they're saying, you can start to understand what their behavioral or thinking style is. And that allows you to change your approach. So yeah, look, I've, I've learned a lot about emotional intelligence and, and self-awareness. It's helped me a lot in my role uh, in sustainability. And uh, and it goes back to that point around really understanding people and, and focusing on relationships. So, Paolo, then what leadership skills do you think are essential for sustainability leaders when dealing with so much complexity? Uh, look, like we just spoke about, I think emotional intelligence is is a foundational capability. I think that has to be there. And, and yeah, you know, that self-awareness is really critical. I think deep listening skills are, are really crucial to really kind of uncover the, the core issue, the core concern, um, and not having judgment about that actually just being trying to uncover it because you're interested in someone else's perspective i think that's a key skill i think also as sustainability professionals we're often faced with really challenging problems you know and and it's often balancing short-term you know impact versus the long-term you know benefit it's really hard to balance so you know we we need to be able to kind of reframe these these problems and arguments in a way that allows people to kind of form their judgment and understand that and then help contribute to to the solutions i think i talked earlier about having that collaborative approach to goal setting and vision creation i think is key Um, i've seen sustainability people that come into organizations and really have their own very strong agenda about things and what i've consistently heard was geez that was that was really tough you know this person came in they had they had just you know such a fixed view on how we needed to achieve certain sustainability outcomes they didn't want to listen to us you know it was their way or the highway and it just didn't work so i think you need to have that that flexibility and you need to understand the different runways that people might have to get onto the the ultimate you know path to sustainability because people can approach it from different ways some the environmental aspects are really key. Some it's social. Some it's it's around you know future proofing the business. Some it's about responding to customers. You know, like there's all different ways that people respond to why and how sustainability should be embedded in an organisation. And you really need to try and identify those. And that probably comes well, it does come back to to that listening and understanding. The other thing that's becoming more and more important now is having that real kind of ability to think from a systems perspective and you know a lot of these challenges we're working on kind of have trade-offs or or systemic kind of linkages you know if you look at something say like putting more solar panels on building uh it's not just as simple as jacking up more solar panels you know people might say i'll just do it you know just solar makes sense it's commercially viable it's a great technology it's you know renewable and so on just just you got lots of roof space just put them up there but you really need to understand those those systemic kind of interlinkages around what are the regulatory requirements what are the potential economic 
considerations, you know, what is happening in energy markets uh, and energy transition, um, you know, how is it going to impact the customer? You know, what is the best commercial outcome for our business? How do we manage the risks that might come if we go about doing solar in a certain way that prevents us in the future from doing something else? You know, so really kind of understanding things from a systemic perspective, I think, is super important. And, and the role of sustainability executives is really to to connect those dots and try and give some clarity to something that could be seen as complex so that, you know, the, the people in the business that work around you and are responsible for making decisions day to day on different things can, can come along with you and, and act with, with some certainty. So it sounds like a lot of the time that you're spending with the relationships is creating a common language. So you have to take the time to, to create it together. And then you have to help people get out of their silos and then see how everything's connected. Is that That's what I'm hearing. Is that more or less what the investment must go in there beginning to get the rewards at the end? Is, you know, Create the language between you and share a common vision based on the system. Yeah, definitely. And one of our biggest challenges, I think, moving forward in sustainability will be, you know, the, uh, getting the capability uh, and the behavioral change required across the organization because it, it really touches all parts of the organization now, this work. Whether you're a finance professional, you know, an asset manager, an operations manager, whether you're the CEO, in in every role, whether you're working in treasury or, or tax, uh, um in every role, it's starting to really impact um, how people go about their their job, and you know, being able to get people to recognise that, build that capability, is going to be key to, to really transitioning businesses and and getting to some of these big outcomes that we have ahead of us. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Here's a little bit more about our cons. Arcons has a mission to advance the efficiency, quality and profitability of project outcomes for its customers by providing best-in-class technology and services. Are you looking for a digitalization and sustainability-focused partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to Arcons to start their journey toward a better built environment and smarter manufacturing. With more than 50 locations around the world, our cons can connect you to the right technologies and expertise so you can improve your competitive position and increase profitability. Our cons has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and sustainability journey. Visit ourcons.net to find out more. So now it's a little bit of fun here. We've got some terms that we use in the sustainability professional world. Not everybody may be aware of what they mean. You know, the first one is BHAG. It's a strange word. Some marketing people may know what it is. But can you explain what a BHAG stands for in the terms of sustainable development? What does that mean? Yeah, a BHAG, I mean, just simply looking at the acronym, the big, hairy, audacious goal is, is, what, it, is what it says on the label, right? It's, it's from a sustainability point of view, though, it's, it's an ambitious long-term sustainability for an organization. So it's really a North Star. And it, it needs to kind of be grounded in companies' broader values and strategic vision. Um, so look, to give an example of a BHAG, um, something that a lot of organizations have is to be a, a net zero company or net positive company by 2050, let's say. Um, so that's a BHAG. Cool. And what's the difference between that and a stretch goal? Well, a stretch goal is, uh, the way I define it, is, is, is a step towards your BHAG. So it's still bold. A stretch goal should, st- obviously, as it says, have some stretch in it. It's not necessarily a kind of a, a home run, a guaranteed kind of um, outcome, but it's, it is a step towards your BHAG. So again, if we're talking about getting to net zero, a, B, a stretch goal might be um, to be 100% renewable energy by some time leading up to that by 2030 say that's great that makes sense and then these smart goals are they within those stretch goals or are they how do they fit in yeah i think smart goals are then another kind of incremental building block towards a stretch goal so 
you know, in the hierarchy, there's a BHAG, the stretch goal, and then the SMART goal. And, you know, SMART, you know, is uh, another great acronym, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Um, many would know that. Um, a lot of people question whether it should be achievable, and maybe the A should stand for ambitious. I've heard that. But then I think that moves more into the stretch goal. So if we look at the traditional kind of SMART goals, I think they're that incremental building block towards getting to your stretch goal and then ultimately to the overarching BHAG. So again, an example might be just keeping the theme of you know carbon to, to be improve energy uh, efficiency by 20% over the next two years uh, could be a SMART goal. So it's very specific, 20%. You know, you've identified that it's achievable based on where the business is at and what it's achieved. Uh, it's realistic. It's got a clear date on it, two years, and you can measure it. You can measure your energy efficiency. You look at the energy intensity you had in now and the energy intensity you need to get to in two years, and, and you can determine whether you've got there. Excellent. Thank you for the example. Um, with regards to your current role in Fraser Property and your responsibility for such a large portfolio globally, what are the trends you're noticing within sustainable development across the various business verticals? Across most of the asset classes where you operate in, so if you look at retail, commercial, industrial um, asset classes, we're, we're definitely seeing that investor and occupier demand for you know, future-proofed, low-carbon, resilient, you know, socially responsive kind of assets. That demand is is accelerating, and it's really at the core of the sustainability agenda. You now, so investors are saying that we want these assets to be green um, and future-proofed because that will be key to maintaining the the financial performance of those assets. Banks or financiers are saying, you know, we expect you to achieve certain green outcomes. At the moment, they even give you a uh, a benefit to the money you borrow from them if you get to certain green criteria. You know, that's the whole green loans or green finance industry. So we're seeing that trend, you know, and, and so it's coming from the debt side or the, fin- the financiers as well. And then the occupiers, the customers, a lot of our customers could be multinationals or, you know, large and large organizations um, increasingly they're demanding um, low carbon and you know climate resilient assets and you know they they're often they often have their own net zero carbon goals um, and, and agenda and the property they occupy is a key part of that uh, so I think that's one thing I think there's also a lot of policy movement I mean one of the big trends at the moment is is regulation and policy, and it's it's moving. I think, and this is not me saying this, but from what I've read uh, and heard, it's moving extremely quickly at the moment. And the the amount of new regulation we're seeing, things like you know, people would have first heard of TCFD, most likely. Many of your listeners, you know, the Task Force of Climate Related Financial Disclosure. Yeah, you know, that's been taken over by the International Sustainability Standards Board, and and they're really engaging heavily with regulators around the world to introduce those those sustainability standards, reporting and disclosure requirements across markets globally. And and we're going to see regulation change. You know, real estate is still is around forty percent of global carbon emissions, has quite a significant impact, and will be a target, uh, a key target for for regulation at that corporate level, but but even down to you know building codes and so on, green certification programs and so on. So what are the risks, you know, in terms of stranded assets if people don't want to follow the trends or keep up with them? I think there is a genuine risk around stranded assets. I mean, and you can look at it from from different perspectives. We see we see assets that will be potentially stranded from a physical perspective due to the physical impacts of climate change. You know, and we're seeing that in in areas that have gone through extensive uh, flooding or bushfire impacts, and and that's just become too regular or or too risky now, based on on the changing climate. And those assets are uninsurable, and we're seeing it in Australia. The government, you know, is buying back those assets because effectively, you know, they're they're stranded, and and that's going to be an adjustment economically um, and politically. 
Then there's the assets that are stranded from a transition risk perspective. You know, assets that potentially are are not able to decarbonize in, in a way that's commercially viable quickly enough. And so that will be interesting to see how that plays out because the impact there will be that, you know, that no, no customer may want to occupy those assets because of the carbon impact associated with them um, or the, the fact that they're not able to, to meet some, you know, some level of quality standard around emissions, water consumption, you know, indoor environment quality, a whole range of factors, you know, and so they'll become stranded for those, for some of those reasons there that are just not meeting expectations of, of the market. Uh, so I think there's there's two sides there's a there's, of the stranded asset argument. Um, and, you know, in that second one, there's also the, the risk that you know banks won't want to lend to organisations to to kind of fund those assets. They'll say, well, look, if it's not about green finance, it's simply about if you want money, if you want to lend money from us, it, your portfolios need to meet these expectations. And if they don't, we're just not lending. It's not about getting a discount. It's just we're not going to give you debt for those. And so then they become stranded if you're not able to, you know, finance them, borrow debt against them, and they're not, not able to be kind of occupied because the, the, the market demand has decreased significantly or they're not insurable and so on. Are there any area or parts of the world that seem to be ahead in terms of taking the lead here with policy and government? Yeah, I think from a policy perspective, was you know, if I particularly focus within the, I guess, the markets we operate in, we're really starting to see Singapore take quite an aggressive approach to to some of those IS, those ISSB requirements I mentioned earlier, the and the requirement for uh, listed companies in Singapore, of which Fraser's Properties one, to disclose their climate related financial risks, and really, you know, putting forward that that risk in financial terms, um, not talking about it generally and saying, look, we, you know, we understand there's risk associated with climate change and that's going to impact our portfolio. It's actually being specific and saying, you know, down to your specific portfolio, what are the climate risks over what time frames and what climate scenarios and what impact will that have on your balance sheet and on your, you know, on your profit and loss? And as that information starts to be disclosed by organisations, which is what Singapore's, you know, mandating from from 2025, then uh, that'll be really interesting. And what what that what happens? Um, so look, Singapore's taken a pretty strong stance. Australia is similarly um, around the requirement for uh, reporting and and on those similar kind of uh, themes that I mentioned to Singapore around the ISSB standards and so on. So that will start to come into effect for listed companies. But as I said, the ISSB is pushing not just the regulators, but also looking at how that voluntary market uh, responds. So I think there'll be, uh, there'll be an increasing expectation that it's not just listed companies that need to respond and disclose these financial risks and what they're doing about it, how, what their climate transition plans are, but it'll be uh, non-listed companies as well, so that'll that'll be quite interesting how that plays out. But then, when it gets down to kind of the building sector specifically, you know, it really varies. In some countries, you have really strong, you know, in Europe, and you've got really strong regulatory requirements from government around building codes and energy efficiency and so on. So it's really government-led. In other countries, you've got really industry leading it, like Australia and so on, and then. Other countries, uh, parts of Southeast Asia are just kind of, they're starting, I think they'll move quite quickly. You know, we're we're starting to see Thailand and Vietnam governments really start to position around what is, what they're going to announce and how they're going to position regulation. And and I think they'll, they'll catch up quickly. So Paolo, how do we measure the true cost of doing business, taking into consideration externalities? Could you please explain what that is and how you see it unfolding. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's various ways and methodologies to use. I think one of the ways that we're starting to see uh, companies respond to that is, is to put a price on carbon and and really recognize that, you know, as a, as businesses, there, there is a carbon footprint associated with their activities and that for a long time, the impact 
uh, or the cost of that carbon and the impact it's creating on the environment hasn't been priced into the way they do business. And there's a few interesting studies out there that if you actually priced in that just carbon as an externality, then many businesses, many large businesses, well-known ones, would actually not be profitable today. You know, so it's a it's in many ways a false economy because we're not pricing in the true cost on doing business, on environment and society. So you know, one great yeah, as I said, one example is is carbon. Another one that's emerging more and more now is the impact of business on nature, and recognizing that there is a really strong relationship with biodiversity and and biodiversity loss and 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 risk to business. And if we continue to see biodiversity loss at the rate that we're seeing, then many businesses, again, will not be viable. If if water becomes um, constrained, many businesses can't operate. If bees don't exist, you know, or, or, or are far less, and again, many businesses can't operate. If we don't have a reliable supply of sand, then you can't produce concrete in the quantities we need. So... These impacts that we're having on biodiversity and nature are, at the moment, externalities that have not been priced in. And one of the things we need to start doing and thinking about uh, and really understanding the risks of are those those externalities and, and looking at how they might you know, really impact our businesses moving forward. Well, thank you. That's a great explanation. Well, we're coming to the end of our, uh, nearly at the end of the conversation, but I just wondered if you had any advice for sustainability professionals that are leading the conversation about investing in sustainability in one way or another in their businesses? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think I'll focus on what's been effective for me and some of the points I made earlier, try and summarize some of those. But the first one I'd say is, is really lead with a relationship mindset. And, and resist the temptation of defaulting to being a technical expert. You know, ask questions, really listen deeply to understand and, and what motivates the various stakeholders you're working with before pitching technical solutions. Now, understand what is keeping them up at night, understanding where the common ground might be. You know, if one of the things keeping, up, keeping them up at night as, say, an asset manager is how they're going to retain their tenants in future, and you're working on something that is around net zero or you know increasing uh, renewable energy uptake on buildings, and you might go, well, look, did you know that that customer has set a net zero goal? Maybe we should think about how this is going to help them achieve that, and yeah, you know, maybe you, you know the pitch needs to be approached a bit differently next time. Yeah, you know, so really, a deep listening, I think, is and understanding people is key. I think you need to be able to quantify the returns of sustainability initiatives across dimensions so it's not just about financial returns it's uh, as we just spoke about it's the the externalities uh, and the impact the potential impact of those it's risk it's impact on brand it's impact on how the business operates it's impact on how you attract people uh, and what you know the 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 importance of of purpose in an organization that, that people are looking for and so really look at the return of sustainability across different dimensions identify you know the metrics and the data that can support the progress you're making i think that's really key and then uh, i think one thing that's becoming more important now i think we're pretty good at this in australia actually in the property industry is thinking beyond your own organization to to kind of help identify solutions and really partnering you know i i chair the the property council of australia's national sustainability roundtable which is you know people in my role across all the large property companies uh, in Australia and, and we are really quite open uh, and collaborate you know, in a really uh, constructive way to try and find common outcomes so that we don't we don't each each go about things in our own way and and really slow things down so that that's that's super important and partnerships will become more important not just partnerships with your peers but in supply chains um, and with customers. Um, to achieve, you know, collective outcomes. I think that the last piece of advice is, you know, that getting that balance between momentum and perfection. I say this a lot to my team. If you strive for perfection in this work, I think it is it's a it's a real risk. I think your momentum is more important, and meeting people where they're at and moving forward from there 
it's progress. It may not be the progress you deep down want to see, but I think if we keep moving forward, we keep building capability and upskilling our, our, our teams and our colleagues, then we'll reach you know, a collective approach to sustainability and, and ultimately greater outcomes. That's great. It makes a lot of sense when you say it like that. So we're just closing out. We always ask the question, you know, of every every guest, uh, when you think future about leadership for sustainability in the built environment, what is it that excites you the most? What excites me the most is the great potential we have as a real estate sector to to really be a catalyst for change, not just in our own direct operations, but for society. You know, we spend a great deal of time in buildings. You know, it's anywhere upwards of 80 or 90% over the course of the day, whether that's in, in the building we work with, our home, um, an education facility, a shopping center, or whatever it might be. And, you know, we in the real estate sector have a great, great opportunity to, to kind of influence people's thinking around the importance of buildings and the impact it has on on you and 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 so in this work I think that's that's really exciting. I think there's some really interesting kind of interplays that will happen as well. I spoke a little bit earlier about how the energy sector in particular and the pro- property sector are increasingly becoming intertwined um, and the role of 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 energy, renewable energy, smart buildings, uh, you know, energy management systems, battery management, all those things. Buildings are going to play a key role in that energy transition. They, they already are. I think that that will increase as we go through this energy transition, which will not be smooth and steady. It will be. It will come with some disruption over the next decade, uh, and I'm excited for the potential role that real estate can play there. And you know. I'll, one of the last things I'll say, just more from a, something that I'm curious about at the moment, is is the role of artificial intelligence and, that, and what what that is going to do to the way we go about our roles in sustainability. Because you know there is a lot of information out there that exists, and you know artificial intelligence is a great tool to help sustainability professionals help their organisations decipher that information, cut through a lot of the noise. Uh, and really present sound strategies that can drive progress at scale. Certainly is interesting what's going to happen with AI. I don't know if there's any regulation around it yet, but we shall see. Well, thank you so much, Paolo. This is really insightful conversation. You really show how leadership should be done (laughs) in the built environment. And I look forward to hearing more about you're up to the next few years so let's get back on the show great i'd love to thanks joanne i really appreciate the opportunity and i look forward to having a future conversation and seeing uh, where we got to this podcast was brought to you by our cons our cons is leading the digital transformation of the aec and manufacturing industries by providing best-in-class technology solutions from world-leading partners and their own in-house development software from the Arcons B Smart Portfolio for building, infrastructure and manufacturing. Arcons is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our Arcons Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community So like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we advance the digital journey for AEC and manufacturing around the world. You can download our podcasts at rcons.net or from your favorite podcast platform. From Rcons Think Future, thanks for listening.